The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you, carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. While they were eating, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is the blood of the covenant, which will be shed for many. Amen, I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it in the kingdom of God. Then, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of the Lord. Today we celebrate the feast of the most holy body and blood of our Lord, Corpus Christi Sunday. And it's a day for us to really consider that we have a wonderful gift in our Catholic faith of the Eucharist. Every Christian denomination, by and large, agrees that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament idea of the Paschal Lamb. So the Paschal Lamb, which was sacrificed, is then fulfilled in Christ. This is why... St. John the Baptist at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is why the Last Supper came to us at Passover. This is why when Jesus was on the cross, none of his bones were broken, although they were for the other two criminals. Because for Jesus, as the Paschal Lamb, none of the bones of that Lamb were broken. So we have this prefigurement. One of our great signs that Jesus is the Messiah and is divine is that the prophecies are fulfilled in him. But there's an important part of the Paschal Lamb which is only present in our own Catholic faith. And that is that after the Paschal Lamb would be sacrificed, then the people would consume that sacrifice. They would eat of of the Lamb. And where do we see this except in the Eucharist, where we consume the body and blood of our Lord. Jesus had already talked about this very plainly in John chapter 6, when he was at the synagogue in Capernaum. And he told the disciples, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. And this was too much for most of his disciples, so they walked away. However, for the apostles who had been with Christ, they didn't understand But they knew enough about Jesus that he had a way of fulfilling his word. So when Jesus asked Peter, are you too going to leave me? Peter said, where else would we go? You have the words of everlasting life. And the apostles were right. Peter was correct. At the Last Supper, Jesus showed them what he meant by eating his body and drinking his blood. That he would give it to them in the form of bread and wine in the midst of of the Passover that had been transformed into what we know as the Mass. So now we have this great gift which Christ tells us to repeat in remembrance of him, one of his final commands. And we see in St. Paul that he's already describing the idea of Mass going on in the Christian community, the fact that it was being perpetuated. We see in the very earliest Christian writings, in Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, and the Didache, that the Mass is a central, in fact, the central act of worship 
for the Christian community. And it continues to this day. It was an ongoing theology of how it is that bread and wine becomes the body and blood of our Lord. And it was at the culmination of our greatest theologian, Thomas Aquinas, who, said, who wrote many of the hymns that we're singing today, including the sequence that we just sang together. He said that it is done by transubstantiation, that the appearance of bread remains, the appearance of wine remains, but the substance, what it really is, is the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord. So that we're not really eating bread and wine, but we're consuming our Lord, who in turn consumes us in his love. It's the greatest gift in the world. And we as Catholics have that access to this gift as often as we want. Which is why we have to really consider how it is that we approach the Eucharist. First of all, we have to make sure that we're going to Mass on Sunday. That every time when we would miss a Mass on Sunday, we're really, in a literal way, setting up an idol of whatever replaces it. And we're throwing away the great gift that we have in this world. That Sunday sets the tone for our whole week. And it gives us the ability to have the bread for the journey, which is our Lord himself. Then we have to be sure that we're prepared for Mass, prepared for the Eucharist. And that goes into reflecting, not only on the state of our own soul, ensuring that we're worthy to receive communion, that we haven't cut ourselves off through serious sin from our Lord, but also that we're recollected and prepared. The priests who were in Milan in the 16th century wrote to their bishop, who was St. Charles Borromeo, and they asked him, how do we keep from being so distracted when we're saying Mass? It's a problem for priests, too. And St. Charles said, well, what are you doing in the moments leading up to your saying the Mass? Are you recollected? Are you praying? Are you preparing for what you're about to enter into? It can be very difficult, especially if you're trying to wrangle kids and get them into Mass. But we can all do a little bit more to just recollect ourselves, even if it's once we're in the pew, for just a moment, thinking about what we're about to receive. Then when we go up to receive communion, to really be focused on what's about to transpire, that we're about to receive the God of the universe within our souls. And there's two ways to receive. The universal way, the ancient way, uh, that's allowed throughout the whole world is to receive on the tongue. So that's pretty simple. The priest simply places our Lord on your tongue. The other way, which we have permission for in this country and in a few other countries, is to receive on the hands. There's only one way to receive on the hands. That's making a throne for our Lord and then placing our Lord on your tongue. So I never give communion to somebody who has their hand just out like this. I know I understand some people will have a child or will have a cane, but the reason that we don't receive with just one hand outstretched is because that's the way that you receive a tic-tac. And I don't even like tic-tacs, especially the green ones. White ones are pretty bad too. So that's, we want to make sure that the way that we're receiving is unique, that it is a sign to us that we are receiving something that is different than everything else we receive in our lives. And then to consume the host right there and not start to wander off, as Father Saunders says, being a body snatcher, because then it forces us to go after you, and nobody wants that. So just consume the Eucharist right there. It's one of the greatest responsibilities of priests and deacons and extraordinary ministers is to protect the body and blood of Christ, to make sure it's not being carried off. Now, whenever I give a little talk on how to receive communion, I notice that some people get very nervous, like, am I doing this exactly the way Father said? But relax. I'm not going to yell at you. I'll just judge you silently in my mind. <laughs> but not too harshly. Not too harshly. So it should be a joyful experience, not something that makes you panic. And then finally, after receiving communion, we go back to our pew. And we have that opportunity to really be in communion, as the word, that's the reason we use that word, in communion with our Lord. And with the entire body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ, that's the church. Both those who have gone before and those who are with us now. So we have that communion with our Lord, that communion with each other, and we have an opportunity to really concentrate on what the Lord is asking us to do, because ultimately, 
Every time we receive communion worthily, it should be something that transforms our life in some way, makes us more patient with one another, helps us to relieve grudges that we have against another, makes us more fervent in prayer, helps us to rededicate ourselves to the care of others and the care of the church. In some way, it should change us. Each communion should make us a little more holy because communion is the one thing that we consume that doesn't become a part of us. When we consume the Eucharist, we become a part of something far greater, our Lord himself and the communion of saints.